salutations, my succulent scions of spookdom. It is ding dong darkness time and I am Allison Dixon here holding court with a fan favorite Josh Vermont. Hello, Josh. Welcome back to the show. If you're holding court, I am always happy to be your jester. Anytime. <laughs> you no, know, no, you are a nobleman. You're up here with the big wigs. <laughs> But you are very entertaining. So you. you're like an entertaining noble. Was there like a, a spot in nobility for the jokester? Or were they all just snooty assholes? They were probably snooty assholes. That's where the jester comes in. He's, a, he's uh, you know, allowed to say whatever offensive bullshit that he wants and people will laugh at him. You know, the, the, the nobles couldn't do that, obviously. They'd be a persona non grata. Okay, you can be the jester. That that, that sounds more appropriate. Cool. So um, now, as most listeners know, we normally talk movies when we get together. And in fact, uh, if anybody has been listening to this show for a good while, uh, they'll know that you and I have been planning or promising an episode on Bram Stoker's Dracula for a good while now. And we were recently having a fun side discussion about vampires in general, just, you know, on our little sidebar that we have. And I thought it was so much fun. We were kind of coming up with so much lore, just possible, like, interesting plot tropes and concepts for vampires. And I'm like, man, we just need to do a whole episode devoted to to vampires because there's so much ground to cover why limit ourselves right i mean really and and it's perfect because it is in fact ding dong october time all the episodes this month will be uh featuring a classic uh horror or spooky trope of some kind nice. yeah so there will be episodes on uh werewolves zombies witchcraft and uh all with different guests and i might even cram in a few ding dong ditch episodes for good measure on some spooky creepy stuff so buckle up friends it is my favorite time of the year and it's going to be a real treat so josh vampires let's do it let's talk about it uh first i have a question sure okay this is very important have you ever eaten blood before and i don't mean just tasted blood everybody has tasted their own blood if they've bit their tongue or licked a you know a finger prick or whatever but have you ever eaten blood uh, that's a fascinating question, actually. Um, I have not. I hate the taste of blood. I, I think most most people do. There are exceptions, of course. But the funny thing is, is that uh, my mother's husband, uh, Norton, is a Filipino man. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, he tends to go to the Asian grocery stores and picks up all kinds of wonderful, fantastically cool shit. But one of the things that he does tend to bring back is frozen blood, because that is something that they do eat in their culture. They don't eat it frozen, obviously. It's not like a popsicle thing. But, they, but there are ways to cook it and prepare it that's very much comfort food for them. I'm a huge fan of exotic foods, but uh, I have not taken that step yet and i'm not sure that might be a limit for me i'm surprised i i will say same uh i have not tried culinary level blood like uh congealed blood as it as it's in a lot of uh asian countries will utilize that product um and then also a lot of african countries there are a lot of countries uh that will drink it raw that will they'll cut open the animal they'll drain its blood and they will mix things with it and they'll eat it as like a soup or they will drink it as a a beverage it's very nutrient heavy yeah the the funny thing is and i and i not only know this because i've been watching a lot of travel food content like on like anthony bourdain stuff oh, i've been watching you know yeah so parts unknown and things and so and other other YouTubers as well that go to all these different countries to try all this exotic food. And it's amazing how much blood figures into it. A lot of these cultures that you're talking about uh, a long time ago had to get very good at using every part of the proverbial buffalo because these were important. Right. You know, food was so scarce that if there's any, any part of this animal that you can incorporate into your cuisine somehow, you're just going to do it until there's nothing hopefully left. So it yes. makes perfect sense. And from what I understand, yes, it's very, uh, you know, it's very nutritious. It's not bad for you, but um, not part of our culture, obviously. Yeah, there's definitely taboos with it, right? Because you go to somewhere like India, apparently, they wash all their meat. They don't, there's no, there. there is a, there's a repulsion uh, factor of, you know, involving blood from the animal. And so 
And then I think a lot of halal uh, culture as well, um, and Middle Eastern culture, they uh, try to clear all the blood um, out of the animal. And I think also with kosher yes. uh, preparations too, right? So, um, so it there it, it goes back and forth. And and I I only bring this up because. I think we here in the West have definitely have more of that taboo um, with the consumption of blood. And it also just happens that, you know, most of the mythology and folklore about vampires as we know them as uh, these sort of charismatic creatures of the night, uh, you know, when you think of a vampire... Uh, the thing that you're thinking of comes very much out of European background and European origin, specifically the Slavic countries. Well, in, in our pop culture, that's where a lot of it does come from. It's yeah. mostly what we're familiar with. But it bears mentioning that almost every culture around the globe has some form of the vampire mythos. I mean, if you uh, ever want to fall down a Wikipedia rabbit hole about just looking up the different cultures and their vampires, it's truly fascinating the, the number of different aspects that you'll see and the different behaviors and patterns, you know, because, I mean, we are uh, kind of inundated with the idea that this, to a certain degree, started with uh, Vlad Tepish, the Impaler, and that that's where the the legend came from, or even from a more medical perspective, some people say that it was a combination of porphyria, which yes. is a disorder that will not only recede the gums to make the teeth appear like they're being elongated, but will also make you severely allergic to the sun and have a few other things mm-hmm. as well that people started to incorporate into the vampire myth. There were a lot of uh, rabies cases as well. A lot of people who were wrongly uh, buried alive. And yes. so you had people emerging from their own grave and all of this kind of comes together in our minds. But, uh, you know, independently, it popped up in all of these other cultures under very, very different circumstances. So it is really interesting. And I think it's like a lot of myth and folklore. It's amazing how much is shared across borders across this whole globe, uh, how we all have a story or we all have a myth tied to um, sort of a, a demonic creature or a ghoulish creature or a human uh, humanoid type creature that comes back from the dead and drinks your blood. Um, that that is feels like a universal thing almost. Well, I think part of what makes it universal as well is the idea that as humans, we observe things in the animal kingdom mm-hmm. that provoke a certain reaction of fear in us, and in, and our minds are built in such a way as humans that we, I think, on some level, naturally exacerbate that we sort of take it to what we feel to be uh its logical conclusion of if you have an animal that can do that you probably have something that looks like a human that can right you know if you've got mosquitoes and vampire bats then you might very easily have something that's got two arms and two legs doing the exact same thing i think it's a weird kind of self-obsession uh that we have as a species to kind of uh you know I- impose our own form onto yes. natural wonders to a certain degree and then terrify ourselves with it yeah i i think you make a very good point and you'll find that in all of our myths the sort of uh um a way to sort of understand some element of the human condition. And one thing I found really interesting about this, and I've, I've talked about this on the show and, and episodes in the past about the ever present challenge for us humans to sort of face our own death and face our own mortality, because I think that that really makes us it, it's really the one major thing that separates us from the, you know, the rest of the animal kingdom in a lot of ways is that we know that we are going to die one day. And that we act accordingly or not, depending on where your spiritual um, self lies and all that. But what I really found interested in digging into the history and a lot of these vampire um, myths, especially the ones that did uh, originate in Europe, and I'm focusing in Europe mostly because, you know, when we think of Dracula, or we think of Edward and Bella or Lestat and Louis, it's all kind of that those types of vampires, the blood sucking, you know, gotta invite me in the house before I can come in vampire. And we're going to talk about all that stuff here in a bit. Um, seems to have an origin, which I found really interesting. And they talk about during the 1700s. And I found this in um, an article from Smithsonian Magazine. They talk about around the 1720s. And this is when cities are starting to really grow. And, you know, people 
used to bury their dead at the church in the churchyard or you know they would have a cemetery in the town within the town limits people wanted to be buried or near their loved ones you know as much as they could well unfortunately you know as the population grows and more people are dying from various disease and and famines and all the things of you know human history um those graveyards started becoming quite full and they didn't really know what to do uh with all these bodies so they would be burying them in very shallow graves mm -hmm. or mass pits and they weren't really in coffins a lot of the time either they were just in shrouds and of course the poorer you were the more likely likely you were going to be buried in a shallow grave without a coffin or in one of these mass graves and at that time period, as people were dying and, and being buried in these cemeteries, well, what would happen? Uh, it would start to smell really bad. And then you add in, of course, lack of sanitation and all these things. And and I think that's one funny thing. I know you're not a, a Doctor Who guy, but you know what Doctor Who does. He goes through time in his little TARDIS machine. Wobbly, wobbly, tiny, tiny TARDIS. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One thing they never bring up on that show, and I've watched a lot of Doctor Who in my life, is the smell of anything. I have to think that going, especially going to the past, if you're talking about going back to the 1700s or earlier, uh, and you step out of that TARDIS, uh, you'd probably be punched in the face with the smell of shit and human decay that would hit you first and foremost yeah very much horse manure human waste human rotting humans rotting animals i mean that that smell and the fact you have no refrigeration so things are just sitting out and with that and you've you've hit two points i think completely on the head and the first one is uh, you mentioned, going back, you mentioned uh, that so much of this has to do with fear of mortality. Because you and I were going back and forth, and we'll, I'm sure we'll go back and forth later in the episode, about the various rules and how fluid they are and how you can kind of pick and choose. But I think that the central, one of the central truths uh, of vampirism that's inescapable in fiction is immortality. I think that at, mm -hmm. at the center of this is that Faustian bargain of... How scared are you of death and what are you willing to trade away to prevent that from ever happening? And especially since, you know, as heavy as religion is now, a hundred times more so back then. So you have mm -hmm. people who live and die in abject terror of whether they're going to heaven or hell for the things that they've done. And you have somebody stepping out of the shadows and saying, what if I took that out of the equation for you? What if, in theory, you never have to stand at those gates above or below, and you could theoretically, as a result, be completely untethered from the morality that keeps you cowering your entire life? Would you do it? And in exchange, you become an addict. Is that really so bad? Is that really not worth immortality? So you've got that. But also yeah. going uh, to what your point was about uh, sanitation or lack thereof, that kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And, you know, some of our best vampire concepts and stories are about viral colonization to a mm -hmm. certain degree. Dracula is the perfect example of the uh, moat of old world sickness implanting itself in the body of the modern world and taking hold going through the veins spreading and turning the blood inside black until suddenly it's such a viral infection that there's no shaking it that's the that's the goal of not necessarily vampires consciously, but always vampirism. It's a virus, and a virus wants to colonize. Uh, another great example, as you brought up, Interview with the Vampire, perfect example. Where does it take place? It takes place in New Orleans. In New Orleans, yeah. Which is very much at that time still, you know, a French and Spanish colony. Yes. And so, and the thing about New Orleans at that time was there was absolutely... Uh, talk of vampire scares during that point in history. And they had to bury their bodies above ground exactly. in that city because of where they are in the water table, right? And there were all kinds of weird legends of the plague being, or yellow fever being spread by, it was mostly being spread by insects. What do insects do? They suck blood and they transmit disease. And so this is perfect proving ground. And one of the best examples also, I thought, in terms of sheer metaphor, uh, was and we were discussing this with uh, the writer and producer uh, Rodney Barnes uh, on our show uh, Press Play and Scream last year. Yes, and because he uh, 
has a graphic novel that carries the legend of Blackula forward into the modern world. It's very, very great stuff. But Blackula is a perfect example of that as well, where this black man from Africa, who's a noble, who is a sort of an aristocrat of his tribe, uh, goes to Transylvania to try to get Dracula to help him end the slave trade. Dracula turns out extremely racist. Who could have guessed that? And, uh, <laughs> So what does Dracula do? Dracula bites this black man's neck and injects him and colonizes his very blood and body. And in doing so, renames him, takes his name away of Mama Walde, of Prince Mama Walde. And wow. gives him the name Blackula instead. Just like, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, by the way, that, that I love more than anything else about the vampire mythos as a whole is that it is the most versatile monster ever created in horror. Yes. The vampire is anything. The vampire is anything that you need it to be. It can be uh, sexuality in a repressed society, which is what Twilight gives us. Uh, it, uh, Like I said, it can juxtapose uh, the old world with the new world and the clash between that mm -hmm. uh, it can be an allegory for AIDS. It can be an allegory for crack or heroin. Can uh, be an allegory for a dispossessed people looking for a place where they can comfortably exist and feed, which was true blood to a certain degree. Yeah, it can be a terrifying apex predator like a shark on two legs with thirty days of night. Where one of my favorites uh, uses of it was a movie that no one talks about anymore, or even remembers. Daybreakers used vampirism. Ooh, I love that movie. Yeah, used it as a yeah. panel for the fossil fuel crisis. Now, that <laughs> yes. Was, and you can have it, it, it can be an action movie like Blade. It can be a mafia movie like Innocent Blood. It can be a comedy, which God knows we've seen plenty of. And <laughs> yeah. even, even this past summer, what I found was kind of interesting was we even got to see uh, the vampire as a stand-in for the xenomorph in Ridley Scott's Alien with The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Which I have not is, seen that yet. I've heard varying remake. accounts. Yeah. yeah. And it's basically a remake of Alien. Uh, okay. But, but, the, but Dracula is the alien, which is an interesting spin on it. And I mean, you even got uh, Count Dracula. You can do it as a cartoon. You can do anything with a vampire story. And I, I, I just, I love that. And I don't, like, you know, the saying goes that, like, like every person has a novel in them. I don't believe that. But I do think every writer has a vampire story in them. I think everyone's got some take. I won't spoil it too much, but I will just say I did write a vampire book and I will discuss it on this show eventually one day uh, in, in depth because it wasn't like a, it wasn't a serious vampire story. It was a satire. We've even got a movie that's coming out soon that I've heard about. It's a Chilean uh, vampire movie called El Conde. And they're using it as a political allegory for a country that's had its share of gruesome dictators oh, yeah. know, feeding off their people. So in this case, it's a literal dictator who's a bloodsucker. I mean, it's, you know, wonderful. It's just you can you can go in any direction. You could. And I and I feel like when people say that they're tired of vampires or they, you know, don't think vampires are scary, I think that's missing a point because uh, to me. And I'll and I'll get to that in a more in depth in a second. I don't find vampires um, as they're often presented anyway scary. That's not the source of the horror for me. This the the creature itself. It's more the story around it. But the whole idea of it, you know, this that that gets down to like, and I don't want to like be too psychoanalytic here about sort of like the things that we're uh, that this appeals to in our subconscious or, or whatever. But I do think that when you're talking about uh, mythological concepts, you can't help but lean a little bit at least into Carl Jung. I mean, sure. there is uh, some, some definite shared subconscious element thing, I think going on with the use of this creature and, and, you know, in looking back again on the, the real world thing, you know, when people were smelling dead corpses back in those days and prior to say the 19th century, um, people believed in a misguided way that the things that smelled bad were what were making you sick, like bad smells, the, uh, the miasma, the miasma yeah. yes. And, and why like in a plague doctor, mask you have that beak is because they would put things like flowers in there that they think would filter out or protect them from disease exactly. which is really funny because we still kind of do that in the form of essential oils if you happen to be 
that kind of person that believes in that kind of stuff. Um, we've just simply updated it and made it more socially acceptable. We've repackaged it. But if you're talking about grabbing your thieves oil when you have a cold, uh, there's a little bit, you're kind of calling back to some of that, that kind of thinking. It's, it's just a, been a, a, just been repackaged for, for your, uh, for your enjoyment. Um, but at some point during the 18th century period, you know, this idea of, uh, the smell of rotting corpses, spreading disease transferred into walking corpses, spreading around the plague, dysentery, smallpox, tuberculosis, and all that. And it's almost like a telephone game, except uh, instead of like a fun game at a kid's birthday party, it's just spreading around in entire towns. And it's driving people to start pounding stakes into the chests of the dead. Uh, as per the medieval custom of uh, dispatching with demonic creatures, witches, and, and what have you. And, you know, ironically, around the time of the Enlightenment, that's when they were saying, yeah, maybe we should stop doing this. Let's let's slow down on some of this. And then it kind of kept popping up, though, here and there, these sort of like uh, these mass hysteria events or, or psychogenic uh, events, as they call them now, um, about people that were convinced that their villages were being attacked by vampires and they would send people out to investigate and they would find that, oh, there's this person doesn't look as is uh, decomposed as they should, or uh, they're swollen and bloated because, you know, the stories would talk about this kind of corpulent ghoul uh, that was stalking them. They're, they're have a ruddy complexion and they, they looked a lot different than say like handsome Dracula would look. We haven't gotten to that part of the myth yet. We're in the kind of old world vampire realm here. And so it's really interesting to see, though, that what a lot of this in theory boils down to is a lot of these doctors that were investigating these things, they still didn't know a lot about dead bodies. We're still in the sort of like birthing period of forensic investigation and autopsies and things like that. And so we're only just starting to understand how the dead behave, how they decompose, how they deteriorate, what their bodies do over time, and how environment affects that. And so all of these these fears would pop up, and then they would just go away once they staked it. It was almost like, you know, they would put the stake in, or they found other ways to bury bodies that would theoretically keep them from rising up out of the ground they would put uh like metal pieces of metal in them they sure. would like cut their tendons on their legs they would put rods and stuff in or well no they would put like stakes but they would also use iron rods and all these other things that they would like put through them um and and so it's interesting to see though like how these sort of uh events ended up morphing into this tapestry that you described, Josh, about this wonderful uh, world of metaphor and symbology and history and, you know, uh, human behavior and all these things that can be uh, distilled into a vampire story. And so I, I get annoyed when people are like, they think vampires and then they immediately think of Twilight. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Twilight. I'm not here to turn this into a Twilight bashing episode. Um, it's not my kind of vampire, but I respect that there are people that like that kind of vampire. <laughs> it's just, you know, there's a vampire for us all. Well, um, just, yeah, because what you were just saying about people who say, well, I'm bored with vampires. I mean, to me, that's a little like saying I'm bored with food. Like mm -hmm. what food? All food. Well, there's got to be something. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. You might be bored with the Twilight uh, way that that's uh, presented to you, and that you know, I, I completely sympathize with that. But that's not to say that you might not be enthralled by the idea of the vampire story as kind of a forbidden childhood friendship, like let the right one in, or the vampire story as freewheeling. Uh, crime road movie like from dusk till dawn i mean there's there's something yes. out there that's gonna you know scare you or at the very least make you sit up and pay attention a little bit and, and there's a lot of crap i mean there's a lot of stuff yeah i think uh, it's not really doing anything very interesting like john carpenter's vampires uh, you know yeah i wanted to like that yeah. movie so bad and i saw it when it came out in the theater and everything and that was before james woods became 
the James Woods that we now know. Um, <laughs> and so, but he was always a prick on screen. So it's, it's just one of those things. It's like, well, okay, he's not acting. But P.S. Completely off topic. I spent the whole day with James Woods back in 2004. Believe me, he has always been the James Woods. <laughs> you know, oh. He just wasn't public about it. That's all. But Josh that's another is hobby. spilling. He's spilling the tea, y'all. We're getting some actual celebrity gossip up in here. I am down. I'm down for that. Uh, I love it. Um, you know, I I think it's it's really interesting though that um, you know some of these things that sort of com- culminated into the vampire myth are a lot of it was just born from again our ignorance of how the human body works or ignorance of how the world works and how nature, I'll just say how nature works, how nature behaves. And a lot of things can be that, you know, if I do, if we were doing an episode right now on demonic possession, we could talk about how, you know, a lot of people just use that to describe things that we now call epilepsy or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Or just, propensity for evil acts because that's the other thing too about where these superstitions come from and sort of germinate is that um oh and by the way off topic uh for our listeners uh if you hear random popping noises behind me it's it's not fireworks it is actually gunfire but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, the way things go out here in the country <laughs> you know but back then i mean the uh, serial killers and psychopathology are not things that we invented. They're merely terms that we invented. Yes. But, you know, the propensity for some human to go far off the fucking rails and do ghoulish and terrible things has always, there have always been wolves in the fold. And so, you know, imagine that you are uh, in a small Romanian village and people are disappearing, or perhaps their bodies are showing up uh, mutilated in ways that are a little bit beyond uh, your comprehension, and don't right. seem to point to any specific animal attack. Uh, you want it to be a vampire. You don't want it to be a member of the village. And even though that seems counterintuitive, because then you've got a vampire to be afraid of, at least you have something that you're up against that you can categorize right inhuman and pure evil and therefore separate distant from the person that you are you a human being could certainly never be capable of what this thing is doing and that is a nice psychological trick we're always playing it's sort of like there there is this cry that we hear in news when there's been say another mass shooting or when there's um something else horrible happening that has been happening for years and years and years and Mm -hmm. there's always someone who says this isn't who we are this isn't us and it's like uh at what point um will you just accept that this is who we are um this is part of our nature and this is if we if we keep denying that then uh, we'll never we'll never get past it. We'll just keep repeating it over and over again. And, or, you know, at least we know we can at least say safely, like, yes, this is this is part of who we are. Our, our species is very complex. It's kind of we're, we're equally capable of good and evil. We've discussed that before plenty of times on this show. Yeah. And then the funny thing to me is that then the lore kind of starts to bend back in the other direction because, yes, there are a few monsters in horror that you can also sympathize with. Uh, There are Mm -hmm. a few that can captivate you or maybe even attract you to them to a certain degree, or at the very least make you sympathize with the, with their loneliness or their ugliness or their isolation. And the vampire is absolutely one of those. That's a monster that we can then turn right back around and start to humanize again and say, you know, we can be frightened of Count Dracula, as we should be, then when we look at him in a, in a certain shaft of moonlight, uh, we he tugs at our heartstrings. Um, when you and I were first talking about this uh, topic, like, what do you think the vampire, I think there was like a question of like, what do you think it stands for? Or what does it symbolize to you? Or what is this? And, you know, we were throwing out different ideas. And I, and I often come back to the concept of loneliness and isolation, because when you do have a character of any kind, but this creature that's limited in so many ways, uh, by what they can do and where they can live and, and whatnot, 
you glommed onto this uh, earlier when you were talking about diasporic populations and people that have been cast out and uh, stories for that. But I think that for me, and a lot of the vampire stories that I take in and that resonate with me in some way are ones that do kind of confront that loneliness and isolation aspect because uh, – I'm a very introverted person. It doesn't mean I don't like people or being around people. It just means that I don't need to be around a lot of people a lot of the time. Uh, I I'm I I like my own company, but it's easy for me to because I'm not alone, and so I can kind of have my alone time while knowing that I have people that I can reach out to anytime I want. So it's easy for me to sit back and say I like being alone. But what if? What if I were really alone? What if I were completely isolated and cast out and had no one or nothing that understood what I was? And, you know, this life that I am in now, um, I think watching a story that watches a vampire where by the very nature of what they are, they have been cast out and they're living in the shadows and they're preying on people for survival. I think that's like to see what that character goes through and how they deal with that is uh, it, it's kind of me going like, okay, you know, I have to confront this idea myself because how, how good at it would I really be? Am I being cocky or am I really just as terrified as anybody else yeah. of being alone? Um, and so I love that. And that's one reason I think I've read interview with a vampire probably about 15 times when I was a teenager because the plight of Louis uh, felt very much like one that, and I was also a very moody, uh, on you, laden teenager. I mean, I was very much the kid listening to the cure and crying in the corner kind of teenager. And so, and so the plight of Louis really resonated with me at that time, at that age of just like, I didn't ask for this. I'm just, I've been put into this and I, or, he was kind of tricked into it by his own grief, you know, and, and here he is, he was led into this. And he doesn't want to be a predator. He doesn't get a kick out of it. He doesn't enjoy the trappings of being a vampire the way Lestat, his master, does. Lestat fucking loves being a vampire. Uh -huh. And so the way they two play off of each other is a fascinating dynamic between if you could really boil it down to introvert and extrovert and then just kind of like take it from there. Well, that's, that's one really good interpretation. I feel like uh, what you're to a certain degree, what you're talking about, you know, um, most of us as humans uh, have done things that we're ashamed of. We right. uh, hurt people without wanting to uh, and have had to live with that. And mm -hmm. have had to turn our gaze inward and be appalled, if that is our choice, at the fact that we have the capacity for that within us. And that because we've done it before, we might lose control and do it again. And there's two directions that you can go in with that. And the vampire has the same choice fundamentally that the human does. And that's represented by Louis and Lestat. You can try to hang on to... Uh, your humanity. You can try to say to yourself, I am not that person, even though I have done those th terrible things, that does not make me a terrible person. Right. And so I can try to wrestle with that and deal with that and push and push and push that down to be this ideal of myself that I would like to be and to function within the construct of human society and the social contract and right. do that day after day no matter how exhausting or frustrating it is no matter how many times that ugly thing inside of us pops up like some kind of a fucking whack-a-mole we just keep denying it we keep saying that's not who i am that's something i've done but that's not who i am or mm -hmm. or you can you embrace it peace with it you can say i am that person i have done terrible things because i am a terrible man and i will continue to do terrible things because i'm a terrible man and this fight is bullshit just to struggle with myself day after day is total nonsense when i can just say fuck it to the whole human thing leave that behind and not trouble myself with it anymore but it's also fucking horrible <laughs> exactly and who who doesn't honestly at least once a day 
I I mean, maybe I'm revealing something about myself here, but I think, you know, you too. I mean, I, I feel like most of us have that struggle inside us all the time, like with society, with the rules, with the pretense, the the artifice of it all that, you know, we have to put on a brave face and go out into the world and be kind to each other and do the right thing. And there's some fucking days where you're just like, I cannot, I just, uh, and that, those are the days that I stay in, uh, you know, if I can. Yeah. And the harder Louis, as we see with Louis and with, well, with, with a lot of vampires in fiction, the, the harder they cling to their humanity, the more they keep telling themselves, I can have both. I can be a vampire who's still connected to humanity. The more fucking pain and agony and misery until being a vampire is the farthest thing from fun for them. And ultimately, they'd really rather just uh, give the whole thing up as, yeah. as a bad deal. Whereas, again, we look at Lestat, that guy is that guy's having a ball. But it was Samuel Johnson who very famously wrote, he who makes a beast of himself banishes the pain of being a man. Oh, I think yeah. that that's, you know, that's what you come down to with a lot. Yeah. Of these what a, what a, what a saying, what, a, what, oh, that's yeah. so true. That is so true. Yeah. I think I often look when I'm encountering a vampire story for the first time or when I'm revisiting one. And I, I mentioned this earlier to Josh when we were talking off, uh, off mic, but, uh, Last night, I rewatched the Fright Night remake, which uh, is from a, a remade in 2011 based on what the film for was at 1985, six, something around there. Around there. So with it was around the 80s. Yeah. And uh, it's a it's a teen movie. It's a it's a romp uh, for, for it's a creepy romp, but it's a fun romp. It's it's overall it's a fun vampire movie, like a lot of the 80s vampire movies were like lost boys cheesy 80s good sure. time you know whatever um other than near dark which actually i'd say that's probably one vampire movie that actually scared me um when i saw it when i was young um i haven't seen it i was hoping to rewatch it before this podcast but i can't find it uh it's kind of hard to get hold of isn't moment. that a pain in the ass i've been wanting to <laughs> yeah. watch it for fucking ever absolutely yeah it's amazing probably one of the best vampire movies out there directed by Catherine bigelow and uh it, it's a must watch and i remember renting that thing a few times uh as uh, when i was younger or really begging my parents to rent it um as things were back then but i love encountering a vampire story for the first time and seeing is is this one going to be a creepy vampire? Is this one going to be a nuanced vampire? Is this going to be... I, I always look forward to the nuance, but I gotta say, when when you can scare me with a vampire story, when you can literally get into, into my head and freak me out, you've really done something. Uh, and I would say the one of the stories that's done that for me uh, was Salem's Lot. Um, Stephen King in the movie but in the book it's somehow in the book it's even scarier the way he describes it but in the movie you'll see uh, this little boy who's been turned yeah. and he's floating outside his brother's window I just got goosebumps even thinking about that scene good job Stephen King I guess if anybody's gonna do it who's gonna freak me out with a vampire it'll be him and the remake was, was terrific too the remake of the movie was actually way solid for something that was on TN it was great that was a uh, Rucker Hauer was the vampire in that right and I think uh, Rob was Barlow yeah and yeah Rob Lowe playing basically Stephen King with the hair and kind of the <laughs> yeah. but, but um, that was a great film and I I'm going to have to go and rewatch that one. I, I think about that one often when I'm thinking about a good vampire movie that'll creep you out. So solid. That one. Yeah. And, and I think Let the Right One In has some creepy moments too. I, but I was more invested in just the kids. So it was more like I'm, I'm just like kind of, you know, seeing how that's going. It was suspenseful, but it wasn't a horror to me. It was, it was a uh, more of just an interesting movie. Yeah. Fascinating the way that they did it. And especially with all of that really interesting cold war era architecture and the bleakness of it. Yes. I mean, visually yes. there's nothing quite like it. So was it scary? Not necessarily, but, uh, Oh, but it's so good. It's another, engrossing. Yeah, definitely. Another thing though, uh, cause I keep, I guess I keep kind of boomeranging back to the idea that people are just get burned out on the vampire concept. And I feel like context and also, it, especially historical context, has a tremendous yes. amount to do with that. And, for example, you were mentioning Fright Night and the Lost Boys. Both of those were the 80s. And this was entirely by accident. But over the past couple of weeks, I've been going back and revisiting, like, a lot of comic books from the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And it is a 
astonishing because I, I mean because that was the height of the AIDS crisis arguably was that specific yes. window of time and also again the crack epidemic was uh rolling out of control and so you've got Swamp Thing versus vampires Batman Dracula comes to Gotham Justice League wow. cosmic space vampires 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 because blood we're frightened to death of it at that moment yes you know? oh my god that I had not put those two things together but that is absolutely mind-blowing one of the best uh, examples of that too was a movie called the addiction which i don't know if, you, if you've seen it. i i have seen that it's yeah. it's been a while uh, yeah very very so good so dark and so gloomy. there's nothing funny about that movie except maybe if you count christopher walken's monologue <laughs> that he comes in to deliver but i mean that is just such a such a dirty black and white inner city film and you've got annabella siora and you've got edie Falco back when she was probably just starting off in theater in new york i mean uh, you know abel farrar at the top of his game i believe it was him uh writing and directing that and yeah. uh i mean it's uh yeah i mean there's there's n no levity in that it's just sheer ground level terror it's so interesting to see the way you can use a vampire and how are we using vampires right now if we talk about like during the night like late 90s with interview of the a vampire and i would say that's when vampires started getting romantic again and also important to remember that there's two different there's two different things there's there's a, a sexual vampire Oh, yes. But then yes. a romantic vampire is, is, is an entire... Because uh, vampirism and sex, sex and death, mm. it, it's kind of built into so much of it. I mean, it, Freud it, had a field day with that. <laughs> right. But I mean, yeah. but the romantic element is just, as mm -hmm. you say, that was where that started to shine. And again, terrific allegory of homosexuality. Yes, yes. And the, and the way that Anne Rice played with that, you know, I actually showed Interview with a Vampire to my... Uh, oldest son when he was probably about 14, 15, somewhere around there. It was about the time I saw it. I was six. I saw it in the theater. Um, and I, yeah, I was about 16 at the time, I think. And, you know, he's LGBTQIA and showing that movie to a young person who is already out or is getting ready to come out or wherever they are in that journey is uh mind-blowing i think for them because uh, i mean my son completely fell head over heels for that movie because it just felt like it was speaking to some something you know and that idea of rep if it's not repressed but it's like you have to quietly express it you know it's just like you know what's going on and in the books she doesn't make as much of a secret of it the movie was more ambiguous than than the books were yes. in terms of the homosexuality if you really want to see it i mean it's in there especially more between uh i would say louis and um Armand, uh, who the character in the movie played by Antonio Banderas. Yes. Uh, though those two, I think, were definitely more uh, willing lovers as opposed to Lestat and Louis, who were more like a like a very dysfunctional married couple. <laughs> well, kind of because like <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm gonna like launch into something that's probably gonna make me sound like uh, the whole Quentin Tarantino monologue about Top Gun, but. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> Great monologue, by the way. Yeah, I love that. I love that. But um, so you've got Louis, and he's unhappy, and he needs something. His life isn't complete. He's not sure what it is exactly. Uh, but something, something has to change uh, within him. And then Lestat, uh, you know, comes along, and then Louis is a vampire. But Louis doesn't want to be a vampire. That's not how he wants to self-identify. And why? so he's whinging about it. And he's, you know, doesn't want to embrace it. And he's kind of doing all these half measures to try to have it both ways. Uh, and then you've got Louis, who's just basically screaming in his face, come out of the closets. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> live the dream. After Louis gets rid of Lestat and they go meet Armand, you know, when he meets Armand over in France, in Paris, uh, it, it's almost like he found someone who could really, like, take him by the hand and lead him gently into a place of acceptance. Instead of rushing it, instead of forcing him before he's ready, kind of a thing. And yeah. Of course, there's, you know, the, the gay couple adopting in the form of yes. uh, Claudia. I mean, it's right. Yeah. It's right. There. Like as a kid, obviously, I didn't see it, but it's all right there, you know. That was probably when I think about it now, um, in terms of just being a teenager reading that. 
I would say that's probably my first real exposure to anything kind of that was brushing on intentionally like uh, queer. Well, there was a lot of queer stuff out there I was into at the time, but I'd say like in terms of like uh, something that was just felt sexual, but very subtly sexual. And of course, at that age from, you know, any teenager doesn't take much to put, <laughs> to put a teenager into that frame of mind. But um, but yeah, she nailed it. And I keep coming back to this one because I think that's the one that's kind of like lives in my soul the most. But I, I know there are so many other great movies um, out there. But I wanted to ask for you. We were going to do this whole show originally about Bram Stoker's Dracula, and we've barely talked about it. Yeah. Um, is that your number one or ride or die? Or do you have a, a personal vampire uh, that you relate to? <laughs> yeah, I was struggling with this question last night. Um, I mean, I, it's so hard to choose because, again, they're so wildly different from each other. Um if you absolutely had a stake over my heart and the hammer up and you demanded that I choose one, yes, I would probably, probably have to go with Bram Stoker's Dracula. And the funny thing to me is when I first watched it, it was, I was a teen. I hadn't gone to film school yet. I didn't really know shit about shit at that point, but, and I didn't really know anything about horror movies either. I was just starting to get into those at that moment. So I'm thinking Bram Stoker's Dracula, that's probably going to be pretty scary. And I remember renting it, from the video store and bring it home and i'm watching it like what the fuck is this oh. weird pageant this is not <laughs> scary at all like the effects are nice but yeah i mean first of all who the fuck hired keanu reeves to do this role? <laughs> no, no one should ever give him a role with any kind of accent ever that doesn't come out of california uh, right everything was so over the top what's with the puppet show what the what's with all the porn noises from lucy the vampire <laughs> Born, exactly yeah so <laughs> i remember at the time being puzzled by it a little bit but yeah you know now i adore it because first mm -hmm. of all and this has this in common with uh with blackula oddly enough is what i came to realize uh was that because also you know coppola doesn't generally he doesn't he's not a horror director he doesn't make horror films you we could argue uh and <laughs> that apocalypse now was a horror film to his absolutely degree. but even then it wasn't really like that wasn't his intention right, so right he didn't set out to make a horror movie really with this either but he made a terrific movie and a very fun and compelling one but what this has in common with blackula is that you've got when you've got Gary Oldman playing Dracula at the center of this, at the nucleus of this movie, or if you've got this great Shakespearean actor, William Marshall, portraying Blackula, and these two are able to do this beautiful, nuanced, brooding gravitas that anchors the whole production. You are not laughing at these guys. And right. because of that, they are the straight man for what then becomes like an extended vaudeville routine, just like a three ring circus all around them of the most colorfully ridiculous crap. And it makes it perfect. It grounds it beautifully. And, you know, we consistently forget that Sir Anthony Hopkins is hilarious because oh. he never gets to give a comedic performance. He, nowadays he's relegated to like the elder statesman actor who comes in to give legitimacy to uh, Thor movies or the, you know, right. possible, but you know, we forget that this is a funny motherfucker. He was hilarious as uh, Van yeah. Helsing in the way that he was just able to ham it up completely. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, just like in the the movie The Road to Wellville, which is not a vampire movie, but... Oh, it's story. great. So anyone out there, if you can find it, do it. But even, like, if you see the behind-the-scenes footage from Silence of the Lambs, of him just clowning the fuck around and doing impressions and shit. So to, yeah. to see him do that, you've got Winona Ryder at the top of her game. You you kind of have to love Keanu Reeves the more you watch the movie. Oh, yeah. Because of just yeah. the, the uh, sort of absurdity of watching him do this. Tom Waits as Renfrew. Yes. I mean, that's, I mean, I could go on and on. Carrie Elwes, uh, Richard Grant. I mean, what a cast. And, you know, yeah. And so you get to have all kinds of 
fun ridiculous stuff like the part where like dracula can see inside the body and it's very clearly just a projection of uh a circulatory system on the yes beating heart it's just, i love it or you know all this great victorian arcana which we know that uh coppola is a huge fan of the zoetrope and the weird porno film that they go into and all that shit i mean i i so i adore it i it's probably probably the vampire film that I've watched the most, you know, but again, it doesn't work unless you have Gary Oldman in the same way that black is so good, just insanity from wall to wall. But you, you have William Marshall at the center of it, who, by the way, was haunted by that role for the rest of his career, unfortunately. But, um, right. You know, this, he's so soulful. He's so serious, you know, that it works. It just works perfectly. So that's, uh, yeah, a gun to the head, I would say probably that's that's my favorite. But which one would you say is yours? Well, we've been talking about it uh, for quite a while. I would say interview probably is, but I'm going to kind of have to... I'm going to have to tread a little bit into guilty pleasure territory for the other one that I probably put on as as sort of vampire comfort food. And it's Blade. I'm yeah. just going to I'm just going to put it out there, man. I fucking love Blade. I just rewatched the trilogy two nights ago. It's yes. on HBO Max. Yes, it's oh, thank God, because that's the one streaming service I've kept so far. Yeah. <laughs> like I've, yeah. I've cut a bunch of services lately, but um, I'm going to have to do a big revisit on that. I just cannot get enough. Uh, any any movie. Let's just put it out there. If you have a sword in your movie, I'm kind of going to love it just because there was a sword in it. And I know that's that's really, really reductive. <laughs> but oh, it's like, yeah. oh, this movie's dumb. But there's a fucking sword in this movie. And the guy in Wesley Snipes, the way that man just moves, his action is so good. It's just so great to watch. That movie is such a good time. I mean, from the very, from the very first, not the first scene, because you've got the cold open with his mother. But after yeah. Uh, from the moment we're in the car with Tracy fucking Lords. Yes. That's all you gotta say. It's like vampires are sexy. Yeah, well, Tracy Lords. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yes. Like you're in. You're you like you want to yell at the guy. You want to be like, get the fuck out of the car. Don't let her take you to a second location. What are you a fucking horror? Yeah. But it's like <laughs> it's Tracy Lords. You'd get in the fucking car. Let's be honest here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then the, just the inventiveness once you get to it. And also, and by the way, again, going back to sort of historical context with these movies, and you were talking about otherness, you were talking about isolation and being the outsider. And that's mm -hmm. so of the time because the late 80s and especially early 90s were this very special cultural moment of everything coming together for you know uh, the, to quote the song for for the creep for the loser you've got yeah uh nine inch nails you've got white song mm. you've got like all of this cannibal corpse all of this music that's very morbid very aggressive very in your face and very validating if you're somebody who doesn't fit in and at the end you've got spawn in the comic books you've got the crow uh, yes, you're you're talking my whole yeah, soul right now because exactly. I listen to Nine Inch Nails every fucking day still. Like I have since I was 15. And like years you old. said, <laughs> and you you have yeah yeah culture that is uh, Marilyn Manson. Although God knows he's gone off the rails, but you have right. this culture that was basically putting its big black raven wing around mm -hmm. these kids like us and saying it's okay, man. You're not alone. We all love it. Tim Burton. We all love weird shit. It's cool to love weird shit. Yes. Don't fucking worry about it. And if people make fun of you, that just makes you fucking cooler. Don't, you know, yeah. be you. And if that's a person who dresses in black and paints their face and listens to this shit, uh, you know, and gives the finger to society, just just do it. You know, you may right. be an, an outsider, but you are not as alone as you think. And we also saw... Speaking of, you know, the darker side of humanity and vampirism, you know, what happens when that's not nurtured, but rather shunned, then you get a bunch of kids coming into high school one day in long, right. long coats and, uh, you know, it bubbles up in the wrong way. But so that was a precise moment of time. And Blade was kind of a similar thing. We're walking into this, you know, this, this meat house and, yes. and what do we go, find ourselves in the middle of a rave because 
was that was it at that moment that was that was the thing that was what was cool and edgy and you know get that then, techno music like pumping man music, that house music. but then what happens the fucking blood worms <laughs> blood out of the sprinklers and you're watching this movie and you're thinking you know is it is this the most inter- interesting or intelligent movie i've ever seen no but i've never fucking seen that before have i right yeah, coming down right. sprinklers a whole room of vampires getting fucked up i mean it was crazy so i love that shit it, it called uh, to the same thing when i mean when i was sitting in the theater watching from dusk till dawn when it came out um i and my friend and i who were watching it together uh, and he he and I are still friends. And so we've talked about this before about how when we realized what was really happening, because we went in cold to this thing, we just knew Quentin Tarantino was in it. It was my first George Clooney experience. OMG, again, teenage me looking at George Clooney for the first time and just going like, who is this man? Uh, and so I was already hooked at that point. I'm just like, Quentin Tarantino's cool because this is early 90s, early mid 90s. And so at that point, you know, he'd already been the hottest ticket in town, you know, with pl- Pulp Fiction and and all that. So, you know, and so we went and saw this and we're thinking, oh, this is just a crime. Like they're bank robbers and they're out on the road and we're just we're going along with it. We had no idea that this was a vampire movie. Seriously? It was Not, all the we end. didn't we didn't really. No, I, I don't think we really I don't remember knowing going in because I'm like oh my god this, this and th- not just vampires mind you they are like monster vampires these these are the ghoulish like capering grinning like cackling monster vampires with all teeth kind of, and kind you know, of reptilian looking kind of really yeah but, but the funny thing is that's not how they started they started as like strippers and all of these really gorgeous you know alluring people and that's the Salma great- hayek and the fucking snake in the dance and oh that whole God. thing you know yeah, exactly <laughs> so so this way you get to eat your cake and have it too in terms of the different mm-hmm. kinds of vampires you can have the sexy vampire the alluring uh, a seducing vampire, and then they turn ugly and become yes. this you know gnarly looking fucking apex predator. And I'm glad that you brought this movie up, by the way, because this is absolutely my second favorite uh, yeah. vampire movie of all time. What I love, and I love Harvey Keitel in it. By the way, <laughs> Harvey Keitel is the best. He never so gets great. The best and uh, <laughs> you know, so everyone, everyone in it is fantastic. And one of the things that I love about it, there's so much to love about it, obviously. Um, first of all, like you said, the structure is beautiful. And I don't even know if audiences would have the patience for something like this these days. But no. from Dust Till Dawn and Predator both do this same great thing where basically it's about a third to halfway through the movie that's just an action movie in the case of Predator, or a crime uh, hijinks movie in the case of From Dust Till Dawn, and you get to know the characters, and you get to, you know, vibe with them and kind of root for them, even though in both movies, another thing that I love is the characters are mostly pretty fucking horrible people. Yes, right? they are. Uh, you know, they like, you've got uh, Richie Gecko, uh, who's uh, absolutely a sex criminal. Yes. You've got Seth Gecko, who's a real fucking hard ass and uh you know a hardened killer and in predator you've got this big manly group of dudes who you know uh, fl- so much testosterone in yeah. that thing oh Man. God, that helicopter yeah. must have smelled fucking horrible and like <laughs> you know and then just airdropped into places to kill a whole lot of people at once yes but just like with uh movies like um three from hell or that kind of a thing it's it's fascinating to me when you can have the audience root for bad people and not apologize for those people or try to necessarily like go far out of your way to say, Oh, but they're kind of animals or this or that. Yeah. There's some redeeming. Quality. No, these are pieces of shit. But on the other hand, at least they're not vampires. At least they're not like a monster from fucking outer space. Cause yeah, you have uh, two robbers that have ki- essentially kidnapped a family. Yeah. So they're trying to uh, meet up, meet their guy at this bar. That's basically this biker bar. Then they'll let him go allegedly or whatever, but they're not good guys. But yeah, when you are facing hordes of in unhuman non-human demonic vampire creatures then suddenly we're all on the same team exactly. and so you know and then we'll settle it we'll settle the score at the end and and see where we end up and also they're not good people but they're fun people which is which is yeah. an important decision yes. to make like you can you can hate them but at the same time like 
you can't hate them that much because they're kind of fucking cool. Yeah, because you, know? you have like in the and you have the two dynamics of bad guy. You have you know George Clooney who is the brains of the operation and he's a career criminal, but he's not a psychopath. He's more like uh, Robert De Niro from Heat, yes, or you know something like that. And then you have Quentin who is quite the sadist oh he's totally fucked up he's completely disturbed and one of my favorite exchanges of any movie ever is when seth comes back with the burgers to the hotel room and he sees what richie has done to this fucking hostage and loses it and just the look of not just horror but heartbreak in his eyes at the fact that his own brother is capable of this and at the same time like when he loses his shit on Richie and keeps saying, this is not what I do. You think that this is what I do? This is not what I do. This is not part of the job. This is not right. We're robbers. We're not rapists. Get it through your fucking head. And Richie clearly doesn't, he wants to understand, but he doesn't because he doesn't have yes. capacity to. And then that look on uh, Seth's face when he just puts his arms around Richie and the denial, the sheer denial kicking in of just, once we get to Mexico, none of this is going to matter. Of course it will. This is, it's, it's sort of like an inverse twisted version of, of Mice and Men. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the other thing about it that's kind of great is that kind of, tr- that brother dynamic um, or whatever it is that the, the, these two guys and, you know, or us guys, or guys like us, yeah. I should say. Well, one who um, has to be literally his brother's keeper. There are so many things about vampires that are so ingrained in our culture just as human beings that I could call my 95-year-old grandmother up right now and ask her, hey, grandma, what do you know about vampires? And she'll probably list the same, you know, five things other than drinking blood, which is the obvious one, but we'll have like the fear of crosses or crosses or religious iconography or holy water, uh, stakes through the heart. Or uh, must be invited in. That's that's kind of a flexible one. On that one's on the top of my head because that was in Fright Night. Yeah, and we yes. do see that in a few. Well, let the right one in, and 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 sort of all these other stories. And I want to highlight on that one for a minute too. Why do you think that particular trope? A vampire must be invited in. Why do you think that's there? I've always been puzzled by that. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, it's like he has to have manners. I mean, I guess, you know, psychologically, from that perspective, you could argue that it represents the fact that uh, we bring evil upon ourselves, that we have. Yeah, it's victim blaming. (laughs) Yeah, that we have to sort of invite darkness into our lives. But that's not the case. And going back just for a split second uh, to From Dust Till Dawn, I think another reason why that structure works so well, where it's like humans, 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 vampire. You know, that's how horror would work. Yes. These things don't telegraph themselves like they do in other movies where you get a little cold open about the vampire. And so psychologically, as an audience member, you're ready for that. No. In real life, if this sort of thing were to happen, it would come at you from fucking nowhere. It would blindside you. It would be the last thing that you would expect. But suddenly it's there and it's a reality that you have to deal with. So that's why the whole invite them in thing i mean again it has it been used well like and let the right one in sure i think that that's a terrific uh element as part of that movie but to me personally when pondering this mythos that's that's never made a whole lot of sense to me i think you get the closest to it when you say that's the symbol of us being corrupted of letting the evil in now i will say this though uh the two ways in which that was handled that i think were really interesting was salem's lot and dragons. Yes. Because in the larger, it's not in a literal sense that they have to be invited in, but culturally, both of them had to do their machinations in such a way that they were invited in. They couldn't just buy up the land directly. They had to use, uh, you know, an intermediary who would then essentially be inviting them in. There are some of these rules that seem to descend directly from the sort of historical records that we've talked about a little bit, the um, the things that, you know, we're hearing about from like the mass hysteria events that happened in Europe in the 1700s yes. or, or one that happened here in the United States in the 1800s during a tuberculosis outbreak in New England. I will actually have to cover that in a, um, a ding dong ditch episode because that is a that is a whole ass thing. Um, fascinating story. But then you have uh, things like uh, the sun, uh, sunlight. That actual trope 
was in, that came around when it started finding its way into literature sure. around the time of Bram Stoker uh, and uh, somebody beat him to the punch with the there was a book called Vampire uh, right. and, and I have it in my notes actually somewhere but we put that in the sunlight thing well it makes, it makes a certain sense because and it's important to remember by the way we saw this in Bram Stoker's Dracula even in that version, it's not necessarily the kind of a thing that we've become accustomed to where once, and this is something that I don't really subscribe to myself, the idea that uh, you know a vampire steps into sunlight and just explodes because a right. vampire is at, at its core a nocturnal creature and the world is filled with nocturnal creatures who don't, you know, combust when, when sun shines on. Them. Right. So it seems to me like, you know, and, and even the one thing that I did think was a cheat though, in the movie, Bram Stoker's Dracula was that, uh, you know, even though Helsing's narration is like the vampire can move around in daylight and, uh, it will only be diminished in its power, but he wasn't diminished in his power. He was still able to control the wolf and shit like that. I thought that was probably yeah. fair. I feel like if you're a nocturnal creature like the vampire and you're out in daylight, you're going to be uh, weakened. You are not going to be able yes. to use what would be considered supernatural powers. But can you walk around? Sure, I would think so. Yeah, definitely. I like the idea of a vampire that can be in daylight, but be reduced in power. And that makes physiological sense. It's sort of like anybody, uh, any of us who say are, we've mentioned uh, porphyria, and we've mentioned uh, the other, there are some other health conditions that make people either allergic to or intolerant of sunlight. Sure. And so, uh, and it makes sense because a vampire is still, regardless of its spiritual origin, whether it's a demon that has, uh, in, that lives, or it's a virus, or it's uh, some other thing that uh, is unlocked, it's still an organic meat sack. Sure. It is a thing in an organic meat sack of some kind. It is uh, because it's feasting on blood, uh, the life uh, force of organic creatures. A lot of them, they're vascular. I mean, okay, not everything has blood, but um, but you know what I mean? Like you're, you're not going to be feasting on blood and craving it and needing it for survival if you are aren't in a body that requires that for sustenance to sustain itself because you are a biological organic creature. So right. things like the exploding in the sunlight or even turning directly to ash, I think there has to be a much more long and drawn out process. If I were writing a serious vampire story, I think it would have to treat sunlight as you did as something like being exposed to uranium yeah. or uh or some other radioactive substance that you can't you know the longer you're exposed to it the more damage you're going to get so um maybe the hair falls out maybe the blisters develop on the skin maybe, maybe there's you know hoping. yeah right and so and that same thing goes with um really any of the other ones like garlic Garlic can also be treated like sunlight in the now garlic comes from original vampire lore, you know, the, the, this was being dreamed up back when people were, you know, they would put garlic in corpses, they would put it in the, um, they would hang it around their doors, not just to cure it, but to, to because it was believed that the diseases that were around would be stopped because garlic is a natural uh, antimicrobial. Yes. Um, element so uh so you can say a vampire would be sensitive to garlic or any sort of you can you could have the same um in a, in a modern story instead of garlic you could be shooting like a uh, hand sanitizer at them <laughs> i don't know um it's sort of the equivalent though yeah and, and it's funny that you uh, bring that up too that it's a natural microbial agent because it does go back to something you were talking about earlier about mm -hmm. all these superstitions and oils and potions and things like that. And I've done an extensive amount of study uh, on voodoo and hoodoo practices. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that involves uh, concoctions uh, like that sort of thing. And right. the more you read into it, the more fascinating it becomes because you come to understand that all of it uh, comes from a very specific uh, purpose. These, these things are not just hokum. Like they seem that way right. paired with modern medicine, but if you break them down to their essences, all of them actually served specific 
very real purposes. And sometimes it was, yeah, uh, to be used uh, as certain natural disinfectants, which garlic, yeah, uh, was. Or uh, in the case of, again, going back to New Orleans during that, that period of time when you had mosquitoes and you had the, uh, you know, yellow outbreak and that sort of thing, uh, a lot one hoodoo remedy uh, was called Essence of Van Van, which I happen to use as aftershave, by the way. But, um, you know, the concept of Essence of Van Van was you apply it and, you know, use the power of uh, positive spiritual thinking to mm. draw good things to you and to ward off bad things and to protect yourself. But if you, again, break down the essential elements of Essence of Van Van, it's a mosquito repellent. It's right. a mosquito and really isn't that what you would need because they were fucking everywhere and people were dropping from the sickness that they were doing, but this warded that off. So all of this stuff is of a piece, but I will say this also about the garlic thing because it's applied to vampires, but really uh, the further back you look at it, it's meant to ward off evil forces, which again, like you say, goes back to the practical use of it. But evil and demonic forces in general are what that's supposed to keep away. So in terms and like of like salt, kind of like used in that same like salt. So yeah. in terms of that being a specific vampire weakness, I've personally never bought into it because it's too easy. It's it's like the final act of uh, M. Night Shyamalan signs where you're sitting there asking yourself, really, water was your weakness and you came to a planet that's like 60% at least water? Are you yeah. kidding me? So I feel <laughs> like if it were, you know, garlic would be too easy. I, I feel like even repelling them to a certain degree or holy water. That's a holy water, same thing. Seems to me like the kind of thing that superstitious people would tell themselves work because they were already telling themselves it's keeping the demons away or it's keeping this or that away and i love yeah. when a story when any vampire movie when the uh, that's another litmus test for me is if they are um turned off by the crucifix or not right because to me if they are frightened of crucifixes and holy water then that tells me that the story is going to be kind of lighthearted, romp kind of not serious not for real, because I, I I can absolutely see a vampire being like, you know, eh, but not. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm looking like a vampire. Because then anyone could be a fucking vampire hunter. But then on the other hand, sometimes that's the point of the movie is to make, put, put it in a position where anyone can be a vampire hunter. And like you say, you're probably going to have fun with that sometimes. Like, uh, you know, again, I don't personally subscribe to the holy water thing, but I always laugh my ass off at the final reel of uh, Bordello of Blood when you've got Dennis Miller with a super soaker <laughs> of holy water just spraying them down and they're sizzling and popping. And Oh, my God. I can't believe you brought that one up. That is oh, that is I like one. That I have not seen that one in ages. Love that movie. Oh, I used to love how Ikea <laughs> would shuffle that in among the late night soft. Cool yeah. You've got to get a kick out of it. <laughs> and also, like, with some of these talismans, again, it's, it's a question of context. Like, even though it's not my go-to in terms of the mythos, if it's used really well, like, uh, one version of that for me was... Um, uh, this is a not a good movie, but did you see uh, Dracula 2000? I have not seen that. Oh, God. it's I'll, I'll spare you. It's terrible. But <laughs> one thing that it did have going for it, I thought, was when they... It was kind of fun. At the end, they sort of explain the whole vampire origins. And the, what it turns out, according to them, is that Judas was the first vampire, which is why, from that point forward, you've got fear of not just crosses, but also of silver. So, wow you know, so we oh because of the 30 pieces of right. silver oh so it's cute uh, it's cute you know I like. that's adorable yeah you know i mean again it's a, a terribly bad film but um but um like, it tries to do something with it though it tries to make it make sense at least it was something i hadn't yeah. heard before where it's like oh, yeah that's that's kind of fun well and then there's also like crossing running water which you don't see very often anymore but it's like can he just not swim he can turn into a bat but he can't cross running water that's another one that to me just um you don't see that one very much anymore. I think that is super old fashioned. Uh sort of kind of being phased out along with the uh the silver or the um needing to be invited in right. um they're more, aspect. Well, they're more quaint aspect. So what's interesting when I was reading through some of uh the historical accounts of people who 
were trying to protect themselves from vampires in their villages and things back in the day, they would eat dirt from the vampire's grave or roll around in it, or they would try to drink the blood of the corpse that they suspected could be a vampire to protect themselves, which I found even more interesting because in a lot of stories that we tell about vampires is you have to drink the vampire's blood to become a vampire. Exactly. Exactly. And a lot of the people that were doing those superstitious rituals to protect themselves later were suspected of being vampires when they themselves died. And so then the village would be like, we need to dig him back up and, you know, put a stake in him. And so it just continued its own thing. But I, I found it really interesting. And I have not yet encountered um, an incidence in a movie or a book yet where this was being used of like eating from the vampire's grave the only reference i can think of regarding vampire grave dirt is bram stoker's dracula uh because when he traveled somewhere on a ship weren't there like crates of dirt wasn't he like in the dirt in his crate i don't know if this part of the mythos originated with bram stoker or not but it did kind of it was popularized by him i do know that much and I, and you see it here or there but as as with some of the other elements it's mostly fallen by the wayside but the idea is that a vampire must sleep in the native earth of his land i see in order to I retain see. his power and so dracula could not just ship himself first class <laughs> but rather also plenty of dirt for himself to sleep in um again seems unnecessary to me i don't know but then a lot of that whole like uh, you know the idea that a vampire has to sleep in a coffin at all really kind of you know again a lot of these are just so uh, so interwoven with old world superstition and with what right. it seems like people needed to tell themselves to feel better about the oh well there are ways around it because that's the you know that's again going back to voodoo voodoo works uh primarily uh through a system of belief right know? and so because of that you have to not just believe in someone's ability to cross you you have to believe in someone else's ability to uncross you yeah you know you have to tell yourself that in order to make sense of of the entire thing, you know, it is interesting to uh, thinking about Bram Stoker and the way he popularized the vampire, honestly, that we know of to uh, at, uh, culturally in the United States, or I should say, in, in just what in the Western world. Um, although it, it's interesting that he's the one that took off. But again, it's sort of like, uh, like Steve Jobs, like gets a lot of credit for inventing a lot of things that he was just he packaged it and marketed it brilliantly and that's why he gets all the credit but there were so many other works well prior to bram stoker's dracula in 1897 i mean there were first uh vampire stories showing up more than a hundred years prior uh in the mid 1700s we have poems and and all sorts of books john stagg's the vam uh the vampire released in 1810 percy shelley yeah exactly yeah Yeah, exactly. We have so many of these, you know, learning about the history of Bram Stoker's Dracula, the book and how that uh, came on. I just I wonder what it was about that particular book. Other than was it just he was in the right place at the right time? He submitted the as a writer, you know, I just think like he's just got the manuscript in on the right day with the right person that just didn't have a bad morning for whatever reason. And then was just like, this is the greatest thing ever, you know, despite hundreds of years or or more of, you know, vampire literature out mm-hmm. there and penny dreadfuls and and things like that. Here's so my theory about that, because I and again, circling back to the idea of. It all depends on context. It all depends on that point of history. Now, as you say, there had been vampire stories before then that didn't really catch the imagination as much. But we were standing on the precipice at that particular moment of a new century, and beyond that, a new millennium. And you had all of these technological revolutions and industrial revolutions all kind of happening at once in a very short span of time. And suddenly everything is about the new invention, the new discovery, the new this or that. And someday we're all going to have our homes wired with this new thing called electricity that's going to make our lives easier and all of that. And again, what is Dracula about? Dracula is about the old world coming to assault the modern world it's about 
Uh, the fact that we can continue to dream up fantastic new horseless carriages and zoetropes and this and that and tell ourselves that that distances us, that that separates us from our superstitious past, but it's still fucking there. We're not going to outrun it that easily. It's a message I think needed to be heard when you really put it in the context of that time, because you were right at the the peak or the thick of or the dawning of the industrial uh revolution and also victorian the victorian yes. era. and what were the victorians hung up on the most sex and that's Sexy what it's about because again you've got the very very literal exchange of fluids and it scared the dickens out of them and <laughs> so all of this coming together the you know kind of uncertainty of the future the fear of the past uh the terror of of sex and the sort of libertine attitude that could come along with it. Because there was all these diseases going around then too that were terrifying. And people, disease, you know? disease was frightening mm -hmm. the shit out of uh, everyone, which is why I love how uh, how much of uh, Van Helsing and Seward sort of break it down into a disorder of the blood in Bram Stoker's Dracula. And those, yeah. those shots in the movie were fantastic, you know? Right, and, right. You know, we were talking about like earlier, because I wanted to ask, like you were talking about the nature of vampirism whether it's you know a virus or a demonic this or that what do, what do you think is the actual kernel of it what do you think it is that that's transmitted that gets inside and that turns you into a vampire uh you know i find myself continuing to go back to the idea of a pathogen of some kind um but I, f I feel that there is a more of a level to it, uh, similar to um, when we think of the way uh, things like herpes viruses uh, behave uh, in people. If you've caught chicken pox, how you can get the shingles later on or Certainly uh, yeah. yes, exactly. Or any of these other diseases that love to just kind of lay dormant in the system or there are also, you know, in the, all the studies of, of COVID that have been going on and all this long COVID and everything that they're trying to find the cause of. Or or if you get um, mono and then develop Epstein-Barr, uh, which is a chronic, basically chronic fatigue syndrome yeah. kind of a thing. And so I would say, and I tend to be a very logical kind of linear thinker, much to my chagrin, Um but I, I tend to f like feel more at home with theories like that, just in terms of if I were, again, coming up with a vampire story. I think that's the one that would probably serve as the stronger foundation. But I mean, I also love a demonic possession story because I, I find that demonic possession stories live more in the mind. They talk about, you know, the the sort of effects of uh, losing control or losing oneself. Uh, I feel like that's the metaphor for me with how possession stories work. And I and speaking as a non-Christian person, I'm still very affected by stories like The Exorcist. Um, and I'm still very attached to sort of the, the iconography of certain religion, uh, religious stuff. I love, you know, despite everything we know about the Catholic Church, there's just something about the concept of a of a, a priest, a battle priest or something, you know, he's in his robes and he's got the power, you know, like he's a cleric or he's a, um, you know, one of these, these sort of like old world, like doing battle with demons guys. He's a Diablo character. I mean, that's kind of like how I tend to think of it. But, um, but I think the, for the kind of things that I get into in the stories that I tell, I love, a, I love a pathogen, tale i love an idea of something that is born in blood because it is blood so maybe that's highly unoriginal of me but that is that's kind of where i go same because and that's why again i i don't think that the trappings of you know like for example let's say that it's the 1700s and mm -hmm. you live in a small village in the carpathian mountains with your family and one of your family members takes ill in that context, what are you probably going to do to make them better? You sprinkle holy water on them. You're going to hang garlic around them. Because that's what you know. That's that's all you know in terms of warding off bad things. You don't know from medicine. You, right. you, you don't have that knowledge or that skill. Probably no one in the village has that knowledge or that skill. And from there, only one of two things can happen. The person gets better, in which case the stuff that you did clearly worked. 
or the person right. doesn't get better and dies, in which case, you know, God clearly had a plan. But either way, like, it's not really affecting what's going on one way or the other. And so I don't think it would with this either. But I right. do think that when you've got these vampire myths coming up, uh, and again, you can tie it to any number of real world illnesses that would have been running rampant at that time, uh, you can see that disease changes the body. You can see that it can turn a person physically from one thing into a very fucking different thing. And I think that that's where a lot of it comes from is, you know, uh, you know, cancer can grow entire new masses within your body or from it, outside of it, from your skin. I mean, right. so you've got a superstitious, backward, uh, uneducated people watching these changes just sort of nightmarish, horrible changes take place and transposing that. And so that's why I think that it is absolutely a pathogen. And as a pathogen, uh, clearly goes above and beyond what we know of, of most bloodborne illnesses in the sense that if we're dealing with something that can turn someone immortal, that can make yes. somebody regenerate, that can make someone shrug off an entire clip full of bullets when it's pumped into them uh, or anything else, uh, then clearly what you've got is something special. It's not just infecting you, it's changing you from the inside out. I would be willing to bet that if you opened up a vampire's uh, body, if you managed to kill it, you'd find any number of strange new organs inside that allow it to process blood in a different manner, that allows it to nourish cells in a different manner, that allows it to uh, be stronger, be faster, see at night. I mean, these are physical changes that this thing has wrought but also needs to be fed. It anchors it to reality even more because if you look at some of the science and some of the research that's been done on creatures that are essentially can regenerate their cells uh, very, very rapidly, uh, the naked mole rat, for instance, and I think that axolotls and uh, there are some other creatures that are very similar to this, where they don't have cancer. They shed their old cells and produce new ones so quickly that they are essentially always young, uh, as far as biology is concerned. And we are looking actively for ways that we can give this gift to ourselves yes. genetically. And there are genetic therapies already for all sorts of things. So honestly, it's we're not that far from being able to do this for ourselves on on some level, a uh, genetic level, yeah. you know, that's a whole other can of worms when you talk about like, are we even prepared to have a world where human beings can live that long? Absolutely not. Uh, as far as the world we've built for ourselves, we're already living too fucking long for it. Exactly. But but there is, you know, on its base level, there is this whole other idea of we can slow down the processes that age us and that kill us and blood is a huge part of that and there's this weird dweeb who's been in the news for the past month or two i don't remember his name and i don't intend to learn it but this strange uh billionaire whose whole like uh, immortality project is actually pumping out old blood and having new blood pumped young blood pumped into him I, oh this is this is uh, you know nothing new uh, as a concept yeah it's, but it's freaky to see it in you know uh, in in real life and that by the way because it you know of the vampirism as pathogen thing in my personal mythology there's two ways uh it seems to me uh to really effectively actually kill this thing. One would be a stake through the heart because the heart is the engine. Whatever mm -hmm. else is going on in this thing's body, the heart needs to pump the stolen blood to the other organs and other parts of it. Because in theory, most of the organs are still functioning as they did pre-vampirism. Right. Just functioning on a somewhat different level. You know, for example, your lungs, maybe you don't need those anymore because you're dead. Right. You don't need air. In theory, vampirism is an anaerobic virus doesn't want oxygen. On the other hand, you would still need to have some kind of a gastrointestinal system to process uh, the blood that you're consuming. Yeah, you have to have a metabolism. Right. If you're, so certain if you're things, ingesting. <laughs> yeah, so certain things, you know, and that's not to say, you know, probably uh, uh, liver or kidneys or that sort of thing. Now, let's say somebody blows a hollow point round through that liver. It'll heal quickly. That's part of the whole thing. 
It's like Wolverine. Exactly like Wolverine, mm-hmm. precisely. Mm-hmm. But I feel like the stake through the heart makes sense in the same way that a you know stake through the motor of a car makes sense. The car ain't yeah. going anywhere. And beheading, same thing. Beheading and... is the same thing. You'd still need the brain to coordinate the rest of the body. Brain's separated from the body. That's the end of it. I mean, you're not going to grow another little body under there. It's just not going right. to happen. And you're not going to grow another head because by that point, your body stopped functioning. So those yeah. two things only, I feel, short of, like you said, uh, some interminable length of time in the sun. And even then, like, I think probably it could go a full 12 hours and then limp its way home looking like shit and yes. like shit. But ultimately, I don't think the sun's going to kill it. The sun might weaken it so somebody else can kill it. That would be yes. sense. But um, so that's kind of my uh, my, my theory on that whole thing, but that's mostly the weaknesses. And I wanted to ask you like, but what are the, but what in your opinion would be the powers? Cause we hear a lot of different bullshit about uh, vampire actual abilities. So what, what, what are your yes. thoughts on that? I like a vampire who uh, has um, the ability to leap or climb or do, do things very, I would say in a way that's uh fits a typical predator if you look at predator prey type relationships i i think uh you know some of the scariest predators even big ones like bears uh you know yeah a bear is a big lumbering creature and you can kind of like scare it away but it can climb trees it can get into shit it, it's smart you know so i i like a vampire that's hard to escape i'm not necessarily into a vampire that can fly because that's just I'm kind of weird about flying as a anything. I maybe because I just don't like flying. <laughs> but, well, I guess it's kind of but, gilding the lily to a certain degree, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, and, and it's just giving them too too much. I mean, you you can already live forever, and you know if you're careful. And um, but I like the idea that yeah, maybe you can just leap right up the stairs real easy. Maybe you're like an Usain Bolt in terms of being able to run well. I mean, you're eating blood or drinking blood. That's pure oxygen, baby. It, like in those red blood cells, I would imagine that when you drink blood, maybe for that first hour or so, it's like having a monster energy drink or something like that. That's just like, whoop, I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. And then that power diminishes. So that makes sense. We we haven't touched on this yet, but I think the thing that makes a vampire interesting, and I think that is realistically something that has developed uh, when you live for a very long time, especially, is the the psychological powers, the the ability to influence people and hold them in your thrall, which is a word that is used in conjunction with vampires for a reason, because there is that whole relationship between the master and the fledgling or uh, the, the the ghoul, the sub. Yeah, exactly. So. I think that a vampire's truest power apart from the immortality and apart from possibly like some physical benefit, um, athletic benefit is the ability to be charismatic and the ability to con people. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be supernatural and basis. You know, vampires in stories are sometimes telepathic or um, can pull a Jedi mind trick on you. But I think that we don't have to get fancy with it. I think a vampire is a good vampire is going to have the ability to influence and control someone simply for the fact that uh, if they're canny enough and they've lived long enough, they have the ability to do that. And also uh, when you give someone the gift of immortality, you're going to feel that you are owed something back in return and you're going to be a giant asshole about it. (laughs) So. Um, so that's what I tend to think with a, a charismatic vampire. I think most of the power would be psychological. You can gaslight, you can convince, you can bribe, you can twist the arms, you can do whatever you need to do to get what you want. Well, and also because you're an addict. And if you yes. ever, uh, you know, had an you up for money, you know exactly how manipulative they can be. I mean, absolutely. You know, and they can try every trick in the book. To me, I like that, but in in my personal mythology, it goes a, a little step further because I, I've always been kind of fascinated with the notion that uh, in the animal kingdom, as we were saying, there are things that regenerate, and so we have that parallel. But also, you have certain species of uh, snake oh. can transfix. It's not telepathy. It's not exactly mind control, but they can have a low-level sort of hypnotism to freeze their prey. 
And I, I like that as an apex predator, a vampire would have something like that. I like that idea. I don't think that they actually need to do a whole, yes, my master kind of right. uh, brawl type dealy, but that thing makes, again, certain things in the animal kingdom, when they're transposed to a beast like this makes sense. And like you were saying with predator prey relationships, the predator must have certain natural advantages over the prey. And since we're a vampire's natural prey, then to my mind, a vampire would need to, by definition, be stronger and faster than the yes. average human. Now, probably not. It's not Superman. It's nothing too ridiculous. Maybe the older they get, the stronger they get, which would make a certain sense. Yeah. Because the longer you can be around and actually do this, so you, not only are you going to, as you say, pick up any number of psychological and survival tricks, but also, you know, you will. Gr- the more you consume, the more strength that you would uh, theoretically, gr- you know, grow. It seems to me. I've always thought it was really cool in movies when they can, like, I, I think that uh, vampires would have a certain kinship with the animal kingdom that humans don't have. Yeah. So you get into the whole, like, them controlling bats and rats and wolves and cats and that kind of a thing. Like, I again, I'm not sure you could control an entire swarm of them or something like that, but you could certainly remain unharmed by them and probably charm them because you have an animalistic nature built in that certain that human beings simply for the most part don't possess. So I do like that. I think it's cool in the movies when they can control them and very flashy or when they can turn into mist. But as you said, you've already like got uh, an organism and we are calling it an organism that's got a very specific set of stuff. Um, So that seems a little, you know, a a, a little too much frosting on top of the cake there. But one thing that I really do enjoy though, uh, going back to Interview with a Vampire, the scene where Louis transforms and the way that he describes the fact that he has now just a new set of fucking eyes. Yes. He can see and hear. Because I think super senses are a part of it. I think vampires would have that. Again, they're hunters. They need right. to have that. So they would have the night vision. They'd have super vision. They'd have super hearing, super smell, super taste. Probably Like any dog or cat, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But beyond that, I think there's just an awareness. There's an Mm -hmm. awareness of the world and the threads that connect it and sort of especially the complexities of the night. And it's the romantic in me because, again, it's not, you know, you can't really point to anything in the animal kingdom and say, oh, that has that. But I, it's just me personally, I always thought that was a nifty little addition of like, you know, it can't be all bad being a vampire. I think that there's a lot that you'd be saying yes to. It, oh, for it sure. That decision as opposed to just living forever and having the drink blood to do it, you know, kind of a thing. I would think a lot of people, once they are given that particular power, um, if they were turned, and let's say in the style of Louis, and they awoke as this, you know, creature uh, that could live forever, so long as, like, I love how you compare it to addiction, by the way, because I think that's really what it boils down to um and you're right it is all part of that deal with the devil when you realize that that is what your life is going to be i think us humans being very adaptable creatures we just that is a form of adaptation uh if you're spending like a hundred years fighting it fighting and fighting and being miserable uh, like louis was i love when lestat just finally at the end of the movie uh where he's like all of, like so many years, all this whining, God, you know, is no it's whining. Out, it's really. just, <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. And it's like, uh, in that moment, I mean, how, I, I, I kind of get it, you know. And when you have to spend half of eternity with another person, and all they're doing is just complaining and moping around, and, and it's like, God, get over it already. I mean, there's definitely like a part of that, like the meaner part of your yourself, your your persona, where yeah, you're kind of like going, yeah, buck up buttercup it sucks but here you are so well, again, maybe you don't want to you know kill people but come on yeah. well again it goes <laughs> so, back to what we were saying at yeah. the beginning where you know all of this morality and all of this hand-wringing but deep down deep, deep down, down we all really would just love to fucking let go of it to a certain degree and yeah the worst most unapologetically awful versions of ourselves and not care and not be burdened with the guilt that comes along and I think we're self-aware enough to even know that. And I think that's why it continues, I think, to be expressed in a lot of these stories is that to put it from a Spider-Man movie, you know, with great power 
comes great responsibility. That's a thing that we foist on ourselves. That's a thing we tell ourselves. But again, you it know, doesn't with, have to. But it's like, You can exactly. have power and do whatever the fuck you feel like. And Uncle Ben's dead, so he can't say shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look what happened to him. Didn't help him out, did it? Uh, yeah, so it is... Um, a, a beautiful and interesting and fun and exciting and an inventive way. I love the idea of when you sit down to tell a story about, uh, or tell your own vampire story that you can create your own sort of bespoke character, kind of as we've been doing here, Makes as we've been talking them. about these rules. Yeah. And it's like, this is the design that I'm going to come up with for this. It's like designing your dream car or designing any other dream thing. It's like, I'm going to design a vampire and this is, you know, his going to be his strengths. These are going to be his weaknesses. How is he going to look? How is he going to live? Where does, how does he get money? Um, how does he survive? What would a vampire do these days? Are they, are they going to be crypto guys? You know, a day traders? Is that, I mean, so... <laughs> You know, maybe as the world evolves and we become, you know, we have these new ways of living and spending money and, you know, accumulating wealth or losing wealth or whatnot. A vampire today in this world where inflation is through the roof and everybody except for, you know, a few billionaires is kind of going through it a little bit right now. It's like, what if you are living forever? <laughs> this is. You know, you got to get really inventive and you have to constantly be looking for ways to adapt. And I tell you what, we're sitting here 40 years old or older and we're trying to figure that shit out for ourselves now, knowing that we have an end date at some point in the future. So I, I do I want to be a vampire? I don't. I mean, would you if you were offered that gift, Josh? I guess that's a good thing that we can kind of round this up, you know, and kind yeah, of start to that was what close I was this ask, down. Actually, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So you go first because I really want to know. So before I answer, just to be really, really clear, the this is based on the rules that you and I have just set in terms of vampirism. No more, no less. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's the that's the decision that I'm mm -hmm. making. Okay. So we're talking about a situation where again I can go out in the sun if I really, really would like to. Mm -hmm. Uh which is really seems to be what most vampires whine about the most. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, so there was a time when I would have said no. Uh, there was a time when I would have thought that uh, living that way by drinking the blood of other people and in theory killing them, although I, I, don't, I imagine that that's not mutually exclusive. Like you could, in theory, I would think, feed off people and not kill them. Right, uh, right. And maybe if you can mesmerize them, they don't even have to know what the hell happened or you can drug them. Or something right. like that, you know. Uh, these days, I look around and I think, absolutely, fucking lutely please, by all means, uh, because there are so many people. There are right. so many people. It's a horrible thing for me to say. <laughs> I look around and I think, you could stand to lose a couple of pints, my friend, or perhaps all of them. Uh, we live in a world where I look around and I see evil in every direction i see people who are taking up space that simply ought not be and i also see a world with enough isolation at this point uh, everyone yeah. so caught up in their own worlds and their own minds and their own bullshit that they can't even be bothered to look around them they're just tied to their screens constantly they'd never see you coming and right. it would be so unprecedented in terms of ease to right. be able to, uh, you know, sneak into these people's houses using these abilities or God knows, go on a spree in Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> or oh, you know, yeah. start to ask yourself, uh, you know, whether you should make a list of the billionaires around the world at this point and maybe start paying them each a visit one by one. And in the end, tell yourself, you know, that you may be a monster. But you're just picking people off one at a time. The real monsters are the ones who are sucking the blood out of the fucking planet. And I think I'd be okay with that. I think yeah. I could justify my existence very, very perfectly uh, in the same way a mosquito does by saying I'm part of the fucking ecosystem, baby. Yeah, I'm just your your the, biological yeah. role has changed. I mean, that's the thing when you accept that when you become that vampire you are no longer really a human That's at that right. point. So you're not really constrained the same way. Yeah. And what would I be worried about? Losing my humanity? Look around. I already feel like I've lost most of it. You know, yeah. my, am I worried about being an outsider and being alone? 
not anymore. Look around. COVID yeah. really proved for a lot of a lot of us that yeah, staying isolated inside yeah. um most hours of the day. All right. And that's just it too. Uh, <laughs> what's what's the boogeyman now? What's uh, what are we all in thrall of now? We're all right. living in virus land, baby. So what's the difference if one more virus is walking among you? It's kind of my way of looking at it. I have fun doing it. But uh, what about you? <laughs> Honestly, it, it I feel like it's performative whenever we say things like, I don't want to live forever. Um, I'm, you know, I think that's a curse or um, I I honestly have often complained throughout my life that I'm pissed off that this is all the time I get because there's too much I want to do. There's too much I want to see. There's too much I want to learn. I could think I could make use of it maybe three or four more lifetimes. So uh, there might be a point that I'm ready to get off the the, the train, but I'm already pretty well convinced that um, what lifespan I've been given, even if I live to be, you know, as old as my grandmother, um, is not going to be nearly enough. And because you know what, those last 20 years are going to be hell anyway you're going to be infirm you're going to be suffering you're going to be worried about money you're going to take everything that we are now and put it into a package that is falling apart even more and that to me is in watching my family members age and watching my parents age watching my parents deal with their parents dying um seeing all that and my grandparents uh so far have not had quick and easy deaths they went slow and painful uh and really not completely cognizant of anything and that to me is a fucking curse so i would take it just on that basis alone i would say absolutely because if this is what i have to do and if i have a moral quandary about having to go out and hunt then there are ways to get your blood. It doesn't have to be a, a, a person, a living, breathing person. I can, I can get blood. So like you want a blood, I can get blood uh, anytime, you know, it could be like Big Lebowski talking yeah. about a toe. So, you know, I, I would, without question, I would not feel a moment of sadness or regret about it, I don't think, because I would always find a way to occupy my time. And uh, I, I, just just given my own personality and just what I what I tend to do. And it's not that I'm quote unquote, afraid of death. I don't, I guess I am. I'm not really so much afraid of death as I am of getting to the threshold and this failing body. That's, that's just it too. Because it's the funny thing to me, not really funny, is that uh, our generation, yours and mine specifically, for our age is sicker and weaker than any previous generation in modern times. You would have to go back to when lifespans were about 40 years yeah, to find a point where people were uh, suffering from as many chronic physical maladies, people uh, of your age and my age. And that's unprecedented and it's fucked up and it's scary. We're all on some, at least one kind of medication. We're all you know, our bodies are, you know, in the condition that they shouldn't be until the, they reach the seventies, but we're in our forties yeah. and here we are. And none of us, I think are dealing with it very well, nor should we, uh, because right. it's just unnatural. And you could spend three more podcasts trying to figure out why this has happened to us specifically. And God knows I have my theories, but in the context of this specific question, you've got it suddenly becomes a very simple because again, for, you know, I, I wouldn't even necessarily be signing on for the immortality. That doesn't really mean a lot to me. I launch right. uh, means nothing to me at this point. And we can there's there's an off ramp. There's yeah. always an off there's ramp. An so ramp if you want it, you know, enough. But the yeah. question, but the question I think we would be asking ourselves is: Are we willing to trade in all of our shitty, horrible little maladies for one? relatively manageable one which is that you got to feed right. the beast yes yes i think that's a yeah. fair trade i think that in order to be in astonishingly perfect health and not, and more you mm -hmm. know and to have power and have a sense of control other than this one addiction which is kind of a pisser but again you can as you say there's blood all around you if you know where to look i mean honestly we're all every fucking one of us and that's another thing that i think vampire uh mythology helps us explore when we think of ourselves in the context of um, being a predator, being a hunter, yeah. uh, is that 
by and large, we already are. Yeah. But we have we have insulated ourselves from it. We don't go out and slaughter our own cows, or we don't go out and, uh, you know, do all the things that commercial fishermen do, and you know, all these things that that keep our food supply going, or that have exploited this planet, you know, to death. The thing is, we're active participants in it, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. And so we already are vampires. We just don't live as long and we get sicker. So we're all taking in order to survive. Yes. In some way, shape or form, a vampire only has a singular uh, thing to take. We are literally taking everything. Uh, everything. But if you, you if you become a vampire, then you can whittle that down to the bare, bare essentials. You only have one food. Okay, that that fucking makes things easier. Uh, speaking from just personal experience right now, I'm I'm on diabetes medication that has completely eliminated my appetite completely. Uh, I have to force myself to eat, um, you know, and, and when I do, it's like one little thing. Uh, and it's weird. It's very weird because I have a very big appetite usually. Uh, so to uh, now look at food and just go well that's not something i don't have to worry about anymore i have time for so much other shit mm -hmm. i'm not going to sit there and have food talking to me in my head like don't you want to eat shouldn't you eat something aren't you hungry you want a snack hey what's for dinner tonight you know that fucking shit is over and so my life is like freed up to do writing and all these other things because i don't have to think about food so that's the thing about a vampire it's like all you have to think about is just going out and getting your blood later and you can get back to your life you don't have to spend all this time thinking about all this other shit regarding feeding yourself you just go and suck some blood but and also get back to living <laughs> but also and i think william burroughs did a lot of writing about this that is also the blessing and the curse of being a junkie yeah all you have to do is get hooked on heroin and you don't need to care about anything else in your fucking life that will be everything you're Higher existence is going to be focused around where am I getting it and how much will it cost and when will I need the next dose. So that's true. That's I mean, very true. the good and the bad thing, because, you you know, we'd like to think that, again, we'd like to think that we're going to carry enough of our humanity into this process to be able to say, oh, all I have to do is go out and nip a bit of blood and then I can come back and, you know, really get good at the accordion like I've always wanted to do. You're probably not <laughs> hey, going to really care about accordions anymore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There is that. I mean, and that is an interesting uh, story angle. I think it, it, hopefully people listening to this right now, and if you're creative minded at all, and you're a storyteller, um, and this is giving you some ideas, I hope you let let us know because I I am having ideas, and I'm um, sure Josh is having ideas. We were you know just about the stories that we could tell that we don't haven't quite seen yet at least in the mainstream culture there could very well be some great stuff on tubi made by made for twenty dollars by some pretty creative people with a Maybe. you know an iphone camera uh you know who fucking knows that's the kind of the beauty uh of of cinema is is that it takes all kinds but yeah i mean the addiction was made for 18 dollars and the ham sandwich i mean you can really if you have a great yes. concept that's what matters you know the addiction right there from the addiction angle i love the way you talk about that because when you feed the beast it becomes something that you that becomes singular for you exactly. a singular focus thing is getting from one meal to the next but then you're free so you're free of everything else you're just the yeah. of that one thing not every fucking thing around you you know because you know an addict i mean a lot of times they're engaged in a lot of the consequences of that addiction too in terms of their health uh physical health and mental health and the status of like their family and and mm -hmm. marriage or whatnot um Whereas does the addiction of vampires addiction have that same sort of like ripple effect across their entire life of like of destruction? I would say probably um, definitely yes, because yeah. then suddenly your family doesn't matter to you. Blood matters. Right. Right. And these people no longer have any concept of who or what you are. You don't share anything with them. You're not the same species as them anymore. Right. You're not the same. You know, you could walk down the street and you may as well be walking down the path in a zoo because these are animals compared to you. You know, right. you're a higher uh, functioning being. And so because of that, it seems to me that it's like a Dr. Manhattan thing. Suddenly it's like, why would I care about it? Why did I care about any of this? Why was any of this important to me? If you want to dig really deep with this and make it less about like, oh, you know, poor, innocent, sweet human beings that are, you know, 
good or like teenagers or whatever facing off against the these big demonic vampires uh you can boil it down to a very simplistic conflict yeah but the internal conflict is limitless absolutely limitless and i'd be willing to bet by the way that after the past three years a lot more of the population would answer yes to this Mm -hmm. question than no because once upon a time i think it would have been a really heavy consideration of would i want to leave all of that behind would i want to change into something else i think most people now if you ask them would say as long as i don't have to be this anymore absolutely please right as long as i can be anything but this what would warfare look like would there be war i think so it i don't know that we get rid of that you yeah. know because <laughs> that's the that's a whole other aspect of it too when you're talking about human society and it becomes a vampire society and there's some like you already mentioned um uh, daybreakers yeah. there's all and you mentioned 30 days of night very briefly as well although wasn't that remind me because i know that's josh hartnett and it's in alaska yes. but was that village already vampires or were they made vampires i no, can't no, it was, that was the beauty of it because the vampires and the graphic novel actually handled this even better because the way the oh, okay. novel opens is kind of like how dracula is a victorian mixed media where it's not a straightforward narrative. It's this letter to this other person in this typed journal, and then the law yeah. for the Demeter. You know, it's almost uh, you know, like, a, like a found footage thing of back then. Uh, the beginning of the 30 Days of Night graphic novel was a series of short, pithy, mysterious emails back and forth, basically saying, this year it's Barrow, Alaska. This oh. is Barrow, Alaska. I'll see you in Barrow wink kind of a thing and then you start to realize oh these vampires are planning their fucking annual vacation where they all get together some uh, in a place that they know that they will for 30 days not have to deal with sunlight and the pickings are fantastic so they that's all right merge on this yeah. town and they knock out all the communications knock out all the transportation and then it is feeding time i mean as concepts go steve niles coming up with the it's so childishly simple it's one of those things that you think why did nobody think of this before that if you're a vampire where the hell are you gonna go <laughs> that you get the run of the for 30 days straight you're gonna go yes. there or you're gonna go to like norway for 30 days but either way like you know it's sort of like when stoners go to burning man yeah. it's sort of like that exactly. man <laughs> Although these days perhaps not the best example well yeah okay yeah uh, too soon <laughs> <laughs> before we wrap up one last thing that i did want to say which is this um to those of you out there uh who like us are huge huge fans of from dust till dawn if you have not seen the movie full tilt boogie seek it i out. have not seek it oh. out and watch it because it's the it's a feature length uh documentary on the making of from dust till dawn i swear to god it is as entertaining as the actual movie is oh my it's god how do i not know about this oh, oh. beautiful I saw it uh, when it opened at the film festival, I want to say back in 98, 99. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. I don't know if it's available out there anywhere, but if it is, find it. It's amazing. I, you know what? I'm just, I'm, I think that's what I'm going to do when I, I get off of here is I'm going to go to YouTube and <laughs> You'll laugh desperately that. hope it's on there. Cause I, again, I come back to it over and over again, but it's just such a fun sexy gross movie absolutely <laughs> and when you put fun sexy and gross together there's just something it's just there's some unctuousness about it you know it's just like it just it's so indulgent you got a um, break and hooker another great example oh absolutely <laughs> Well, you know, I don't think that uh, we have sucked this topic dry um, because there's way more we could talk about. Way, way, way more, I think, on this topic. You could almost just have a whole podcast devoted just to vampire stuff. Easily. And then Easily. each, and then some of the things that we talked about would be their own episodes. It's just wild how much uh, we could talk about. And I know if uh, you're out there listening, you're probably bursting at the seams wondering why we didn't mention so many other things that we could have talked about. Um, but there's only so much you can fit into two hours. We did our best, Josh, but I think we did it. I think we did it pretty well. So 
If you have more to add, please pop over to the Facebook page, uh, Ding Dong Darkness Time Podcast, or you can send me an email at ddarknesstime at gmail.com. I also highly recommend you pop over to uh, listen to Press Play and Scream. Uh, just They have a ton of episodes over there. Um, Josh and Kelly talking about horror movies, talking to people who make horror movies, just there's just so much greatness over there and i've uh been thrilled to be over there uh on a few of their episodes so if i can um, add one more thing yes uh, i do have a horror compilation coming yes. out in time for halloween this year i'm going to be promoting it uh mostly probably via twitter because i'm too stupid to promote it anywhere else and um vampires didn't make it into this one they almost almost did but uh, still, I think it's pretty fantastic. It's going to be called The Breaking Machine and other stories. So keep an eye out uh, for uh, Amazon uh, Kindle because it's uh, it's definitely going to be released there on a bunch of other platforms. I hope you guys will read it. I'm real proud of it. Yeah. Oh, I'm Josh's writing is frankly stunning and i hate him because i'm jealous so um, just as a writer as a writer i hate him <laughs> that's the best compliment i've ever gotten <laughs> no he's just in, in the way josh speaks you know you hear him talk and my uh my friend chris and i and you know you know chris because he's on the show uh yes. occasionally as well um we were just talking about you earlier today and we were just talking about you know how josh just kind of like pops off with these like phrases and just like that he just pulls these great observations out of his head and and i'm like yeah and chris is like yeah he's really good at that isn't he i'm like yeah yeah he's really good at it i can't wait to have him on the show again <laughs> because of that so um if you like josh on this show then you're definitely going to like his books um and i will be promoting them on this show and i will pr be promoting them on social media as well when they are released so um if you like me then you will go buy josh's book and that is the ultimatum that I am delivering uh, tonight. So yeah, thank you. um, you're very welcome. And thank you uh, yet again for coming onto this show. We do have another movie episode that I still need to edit and get out, but I like to space those out as like fun little nuggets. And I know you and I have been planning on doing uh, a Cronenberg fest yeah. for a bit. We need to get down and dirty with that very soon. Um, and of course there's just no shortage. Every time I watch some messed up movie or have some weird movie observation, I want to uh, be like, Hey Josh, we need to do an episode on this one. <laughs> Anytime. We need to talk about this. Anytime. So, oh my God. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that will uh, leave it for now, but I will be back with another spooky spectacular very soon. Uh, keep your steaks or your garlic close because if there aren't any vampires around, they can be handy in the making of kebabs. And, you know, that just makes everything better. So, mm, steak and garlic. Right. <laughs> I know, steak and garlic. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> speaking of having no appetite, I appear to have one now. So this episode was produced by yours truly, Allison Dixon, and wouldn't be possible without the amazing contributions of countless friends, family and supporters. Big shouts also go out to Nathaniel Dixon for all the show art, as well as Spencer Morlock and Ken Dixon for the music. I'll be back with something new next week. In the meantime, you know what to do. Be good, you little ding dongs. <laughs>